I've had about oh, easily over 10 years worth of anxiety. That's a bad way of describing it. I have had a history of anxiety for at least 10 years. And honestly, when I really think about it, I think it's been longer than that because I can remember these same anxious feelings. I just didn't know how to categorize them at the time. As early as fourth, fifth, maybe sixth grade, definitely by sixth grade, but even possibly fourth grade. And there's no real way to describe anxiety other than just this state of unknowingness, the state of fear, and you don't know why you you have it. You just feel like something bad is going to happen or you feel like you're doing something wrong. It's just something doesn't feel right. So it's this constant knot of worry over something that you don't know what it's about. So obviously you can tell this is something that sucks. <laughs> it's something that you don't want to experience. It really, it held me back for a long time. It lowered my confidence. It affected my health. It's something that still to this day, I will experience spikes of, but nothing to the extent that I did before. There came a point in my life where I finally just decided I needed to fix this, that this is not normal, this is not healthy, this isn't something that we should be experiencing, this isn't living. And I, I talked about it on a podcast for the first time actually. Um, I'll see if I can link it down below because I go over my whole severe panic attack that I had uh, where it was just the last straw for me where I just decided that I needed to make changes and figure out what was going on in my body. But that was really the last straw for me. So that was about, four or five years ago when um, I had that extreme panic attack, not even anxiety attack, but panic attack, which is just even more severe, where in that moment I thought that I was dying. And ever since then, I've been on this mission to figure out what it is that causes anxiety, how to get rid of it, because this can't be a natural state. There has to be something that causes this. What's crazy is also when you, you know, Google anxiety treatments, really the only treatments that are available are medications and meditation, <laughs> the two M's. Those, those are really the only things that people say that you should do if you have anxiety. And I just felt like that couldn't be the case because with any part of health, and as we now know, health goes beyond our physical health. Mental health is physical health. And so that's really, again, when I decided to go on this journey of figuring out what causes anxiety and how I can get rid of it. So today I'm going to be sharing the five things that made the biggest difference with my anxiety that I've really played around with and researched and that I use with my own clients now because they do work so effectively and none of these include medications. So it's pretty amazing the things that you can do just for your everyday lifestyle that's actually helping to address the cause rather than just addressing the symptoms. Now, if you do suffer from anxiety, of course, how you handle it is up to you and your choice. And this is not to replace medical advice, but if you are looking for those natural means, then these are at least some tools that you can utilize and things that I have found work well for me and that I've found also work well with my clients. So through my research, I was really looking into, first of all, what causes anxiety because we can't really help to address it until we know what causes it, right? If we don't know what causes it, then we're always just chasing symptoms and chasing the after effect, not just getting rid of it in the first place. So with my background in physiology, nutrition, all of this stuff that actually, you know, can really help to understand how our body works, I realized that this feeling of anxiety is a state of fight or flight. We have two types of states in our body. There's rest and repair and fight or flight. You can't have anxiety in rest and repair mode. You physically have all the same responses in fight or flight mode that is anxiety. So, you know, the the rapid breathing, the rapid heart rate, the increased cortisol levels, aka stress hormones, which is also why you'll see that a lot of people who do experience anxiety, since they're always stuck in the state of fight or flight, they tend to experience gut issues. So IBS is one, bloating is another, maybe even SIBO. I personally had a really long history of bloating as well that was super uncomfortable that I'll be talking about later in the future, but it's because the body, when you're in the state of fight or flight, is shifting the blood flow away from these non-essential organs because it thinks you're in this dangerous situation Situation. And one of those non-essential organs is your GI tract because your body's reasoning for this is, hey, if I have to run away from this tiger, I don't need to be digesting my last meal. I need to be pumping that energy to my muscles, to my heart, to my brain so that I can figure out how to get out of the situation. Problem is these situations aren't just a minute long anymore that they used to be back in like caveman days. For people who experience anxiety, this is all the time. So it's why a lot of people with anxiety will have these gut issues as well. And that's, you know, a telltale sign of what the real cause of the problem is. It's being in the state of fight or flight mode, not rest and repair. Because anxiety cannot live in rest and repair mode. It's just impossible. So with that in mind, my mission really went to looking at how we can reduce fight or flight mode. What are all the different things that can reduce our feeling of being in this stressful situation? And I've talked about this before, but stress is not just emotional. It's also physical and environmental. 
environmental and chemical. So there's a lot of different stressors and they all affect our body equally the same. So the ones I'm really going over today are the physical and the environmental and even the chemical stressors. Because if we can address that, that's a lot of stressors that we're reducing and making it so that our bodies are put into this environment where anxiety cannot thrive. So the very first thing that I found helps so significantly to bring our body out of that state of fight or flight mode is high quality sleep. That is why I'm so passionate about getting high quality sleep, not just because you feel good the next morning, but also because you have reduced cortisol, that stress hormone levels the next day when you do get high quality sleep. But on the flip side, when you have poor sleep, when you have poor sleep quality, you could be sleeping eight hours, but still have poor sleep quality, then this actually causes increased stress levels the next day. So if you are getting poor sleep, then that means you're already putting your body into that state of fight or flight mode the next day. And that's where anxiety lives. That's where it thrives. So there's a bunch of studies on how sleep is related to cortisol, the stress hormone. There's one interesting one that I found that had 282 children in it. So a pretty big sample size. And they measured both sleep quality and sleep quantity in regards to the stress hormone. And they found that when these children experienced poor sleep or didn't get enough sleep, then this actually had a significant increase on cortisol the next day. So I used a lot of tools to focus on my sleep quality and quantity. Things like proper nutrient timing that I talked about in the intermittent fasting program, creating a nighttime routine, getting a sleep mask, not using tech late at night. And I do have a lot of videos on this, so I'll link them below, but you can also check out this one right here. And it goes into some of the tools that I utilize to help to improve my sleep quality, but really focusing on sleep first was crucial. And if you're wondering, okay, well, I can just take melatonin to get better sleep. No, not true. And I really dive deep into this with this video. Okay, number two, getting outside and absorbing those negative ions. And I know how woo woo that sounds, but there's actually about 80 years worth of research that's behind this whole negative ion situation. Now, if you think back to like your chemistry days, there's both positive and negative ions that can be produced by anything really. Positive ions, although they sound good, actually aren't. They can really drain our system. They make us feel fatigued and tired. And these are usually produced by man-made products. Air conditioning is one that's really detrimental to negative ions. And negative ions are the ones that ironically have a positive impact on our health. Negative ions are produced by things like crashing waves, wind, thunderstorm, the ground. So literally like standing on grass. And negative ions are linked to lower rates of depression, decreased stress levels, decreased cortisol levels, all these things that we want to achieve when we're trying to reduce anxiety and get out of that state of fight or flight mode. In fact, there's a review done on 33 different studies on negative ions, and it found that there's a really strong correlation between increased negative ion exposure, aka getting outside and absorbing these things and decrease rates of depression. So as a result, rain or shine, I would spend at least 30 minutes a day outside, absorbing those negative ions, going on walks, just being outside and allowing myself to be in the situation where I could actually be in that state of rest and repair. Now I've never really fully done a video just on negative ions and it's something that I want to do, but if you guys want to learn more about this, let me know in the comments below and I'll create a video just on negative ions. Okay, number three. So clearly a lot of these things trace back to cortisol, right? So again, I wanted to reduce my cortisol levels. One way to do this is through exercise. Now we often think of exercise just as pure goodness. We need exercise. We need it in order to be healthy and strong and to reduce stress levels to some extent. But a lot of people, especially those who tend to have anxiety or are more type A, have the tendency to over-exercise. And I know I was definitely in that boat. I was running five to seven times a week, doing multiple hours of workouts, doing hit multiple times a week, not just the one or two times that you're supposed to do, because we tend to think more is better. But this weird phenomenon happens when we start to actually work out more or excessively that instead of lowering our stress levels, our cortisol levels start to stay higher. So this is where I really made the switch from running to walking and that has been so extremely impactful. And I even doubled up on that and used my walking with going outside to get those negative ions too. And I'm not saying that high intent high intensity interval training, strength training, running are bad. It's just for some situations, it might be a good idea to reduce it or drastically reduce it, especially in my case where I was having such extreme anxiety, at least for a short amount of time, and then to reintroduce it in a healthy way. And I do go into detail on running versus walking and how this can actually help to reduce your stress levels with this video. All right, number four, probably the least popular one, and it was to address tech. Now tech, meaning not just my phone, but also my computer and my TV. And I feel like I have more tech than that, but you get what I'm saying. So if I was addressing stress, then I think most of us can agree that phones lead to a lot of stress, but there's actually studies that have found every time you receive a notification on your phone, whether it be a positive notification or a negative one, it increases those little spikes of cortisol. There's actually this section of your phone, especially if you have an iPhone, I don't know about the others, where you can see how many notifications you receive a day. And I was receiving upwards of two, 300 different notifications a day. It's not not necessarily text messages or Instagram messages. It's also things like calendar alerts or whatever, just all 
all of these notifications popping up on your phone really compound into significantly higher cortisol levels. So what I did, a bunch of things with technology, like I said, I stopped using my phone right before bed. That's a whole other conversation. But I also shut off all notifications from my phone outside of just texts and phone calls. So the OG type of notifications. So instead of getting two to 300 different notifications per day, I was really only getting like mm, 10 to 15. I'm showing how popular I am with my text messages right now. <laughs> and that in itself helped to bring cortisol levels down. I also put my phone on do not disturb at night, but again, there's a lot I did with my phone, but the biggest one is notifications being turned off. And number five, stabilizing blood glucose levels. And I know this sounds super strange and how does this have anything to do with anxiety? But if you look at the physiology behind when you have higher low blood glucose levels, then it actually makes a ton of sense. And this is why I'm always really big on educating and making sure that you understand the physiology behind what's happening in your body when we don't just take advice of others or traditional wisdom, but we actually look at what the physiology is in our body, we can make some pretty ground ground breaking discoveries. And that's where I really tied in my anxiety with my blood glucose levels. Now, if you watch any of my videos and you've definitely heard me talk about blood glucose levels, and this isn't just for diabetics, this is for everyone. I don't have diabetes, but this still had a really big impact on my anxiety level. So what happens when you have these, these spikes and falls of blood glucose that can happen if you're eating too often, eating too high of a carbohydrate diet, eating a lot of sugar, having a lot of stress, all of this can cause spikes and falls in our blood glucose levels. So when we have a fall in our blood glucose levels, or it's called hypoglycemia, glycemia, this results in our body secreting cortisol, the stress hormone, because being hypoglycemic is not good for our body. We don't want to have high and we don't want to have low blood glucose levels. We want to be stable. So being in that low blood glucose, that can be a little bit dangerous for us. So as a result, our body secretes this cortisol in order to make it so that it can bring that blood glucose back up. But it also puts us into the state of fight or flight because our cortisol is increased. So by balancing blood glucose levels, by keeping it more stable and not having those dips and spikes, makes it so that it can reduce your cortisol secretion so that you don't put yourself in this state of fight or flight mode. And this is where I really achieved this through the proper nutrient timing and with intermittent fasting that I talk about in the complete intermittent fasting bundle. You can check that out below. But all of these strategies aren't to get rid of the symptoms. It's to put your body in a place where you don't have to experience anxiety in the first place. Will you ever get anxiety again? Probably. I still get anxiety on the occasion. And and it's not that anxiety in general is bad, it's the constant anxiety that's bad. Anxiety is an emotion, just like fear, worry, any of those. So experiencing anxiety on the occasion is okay, but experiencing it often isn't sustainable. It doesn't feel good, and that's when you can lead to those panic disorder situations like what I experienced. So by putting yourself into the state where it can foster a rest and repair mode rather than that state of fight or flight can at least help to significantly reduce your risk of anxiety in the first place. Now, you're probably also wondering about different supplements that can help. There are some that can help when used properly, and I do go over my experience with CBD oil in this video. I use that for a year, so you can check that all out. And if you love this information, on how you can actually feel good again and understand how your body works, make sure you subscribe right here. I come out with new videos every Tuesday and Thursday. All right, guys, thanks for watching. I really hope this helps you with reducing your anxiety, and I'll see you in my next video.